last minute. That seems to be the human nature in general. Whenever you have a deadline, most people <laughs> either violate the deadline a little bit or uh, do, do the job right before the deadline. Say it again. Especially programmers. Especially <laughs> Surprisingly, it's much more common than programmers, though. That's OK, I guess let's get started. People will come in. Or maybe people are not coming in because these videos are all online. Is that? There's probably still value in coming to class, though, because you can ask questions and you can interact. OK, today uh, my goal is to finish microprogram microarchitectures and start pipelining. If we finish microprogram microarchitectures and if you understand everything well, that's, uh, we'll have achieved our goal, I think. But first, homework two is out. How many of you have started it? Great. We have at least one person. Uh, it's due February 11th. It's going to be a lot of fun, I think because you're going to actually write the microcode for the entire LC3B. We're going to uh, write some of it today, and you'll see how much fun it is. But in the homework, you'll understand. You'll basically design a microcoded machine. Well, you'll basically implement a machine that's already designed for you. And in the lab, uh, in the second lab, you can actually implement your own microcoded machine, and I'll get to that. But start early, the homework actually will take time. Uh, it's not a short homework. But again, you know that the purpose of the homework is for you to understand the material and learn it very well. Uh, and hopefully, you'll learn microcoding very well once you do it. Have you started that? Yeah, is, there, is there a cheat sheet somewhere, somewhere that actually like, explains what all these cryptic control signals are? Oh, well, we'll go, over it. we'll go over some of them today. So you started too early, but that's good. And you can certainly ask the TAs, but we'll go over some of them. I'll, I'll show you what, uh, what parts of the LC3B uh, Appendix C uh, can, can help you with that. And some of it is actually you'll need to imagine a little bit. So you'll need to be creative also, which is good. OK. And there are a bunch of other questions on ISA, microarchitecture, and everything else we covered. So it should be fun. And lab assignment one, you know that it's due Friday. If you haven't started, uh, the danger signs are blinking. So you should start, uh, yes. Do we just need to have it in the submission folder by the end of private lab, or do we need to go to the lab to get it checked? Uh, go to the lab and get it checked off. You, can't, you, you don't have to go on Friday. You can go on Thursday, right? I, th I think that's the only lab that's left. But you need to go and uh, be present and talk with the TAs for all lab, lab checkoffs, unless we change that policy later on. OK. Is it 6 or Friday? I believe it's 6.30 to 9.30, right? Yes. So you get the maximum <laughs> possible time. That's, that's a bad time? OK. That's right. But you can, you can check off on, uh, in any lab. I'd like to make sure that everybody knows that. You can go to any lab to check off. If you're done early, go ahead and check off at any lab. Yes. If uh, our lab section is Tuesday, I guess, the grading was not ready for this Tuesday, can we go next Tuesday? Oh, uh, you mean? Uh, to turn in your assignment. I mean, to have it turned in by Friday to get checked off on Tuesday? No, I get checked off on Friday, right? Okay. Even if we can't make out of the line, we can't make two lab assumptions. Okay. So definitely hand in your lab assignment and try to get checked off if you have a bad conflict at that time. Talk with the TAs. I think talk with the TAs is the best answer. Okay? Okay. So if you need help, Go to the lab sessions definitely on the office hours, but you know that hopefully by now. Lab assignment two, we br briefly talked about it last time. Uh, start early again. You'll do a lot of very log, and you'll have to brush up your very log, which will be fun also. Uh, and remember the individual assignment policy. There will be extra credit. There were some questions about this. Uh, I will cover this again, but basically you will design a microcoded MIPS machine if you want to do the extra credit. And the extra credit will be substantial. I'll announce the exact uh, uh, fraction of the course grade later. And you will get partial credit for the extra credit, too. Even if you don't get the full design right, 
I would like you to take a stab at it and figure out what you can do, uh, how you can design a microcoded machine, because I, I want you guys to be creative. Yes? Do we need to turn in both the single arch cycle architecture and the microcoded, or would we just need to turn in the microcoded? No, you, you need to turn in the single cycle microarchitecture, both of them. Yeah, this is in addition. That's right. Yeah, we don't want you to uh, just work on the microcoded. You should finish the regular lab for regular credits, turn it in, and then turn in a separate version as extra credit. And TAs will help you uh, on the logistics of exactly how, to, how you will do that. But I would like more people to attempt the extra credit, so uh, we'll be liberally giving partial credit uh, in this assignment. And, but but uh, uh, with the condition that you will document what you've done and demonstrated well to the TAs, which means that you'll need to talk with the TAs on the extra credit part. Because this is more of a design uh, that's up to you, right? So you'll need to be able to explain your design, how it works. And you can, uh, you can get some help from uh, the reading that I'll describe today. Patterson and Hennessy book has a microcoded implementation of the MIPS in one of its appendices. It's not fully designed, and I think you can probably do better if you think about it uh, after this lecture. So I'll encourage you to think about it on your own, too. OK, readings for next lecture. We'll cover pipelining. We'll get, go into the details of pipelining and a lot of issues in pipeline machines. So it'll be very helpful if you read this chapter. And also, uh, we, we have pipelined LC3B microarchitecture handout. Uh, we're going to look at both MIPS as well as LC3B as well as fundamental issues in pipelining. And these will be just examples that we'll follow. So both of these readings would be very, very helpful if you do it uh, by the end of the weekend. OK, today's agenda will finish uh, the microprogrammed LC3B design. We'll have a lot of fun with it, do some microprogramming, uh, and start pipelining. But a little bit of review of the last lecture just to get you up to speed. We finished single cycle microarchitectures. You remember that. We covered microarchitecture design principles. You hopefully remember all, of, all those three. Uh, take away those principles from this course. Those are very important. And we covered basic performance evaluation. We, I'm giving you the execution time equation. I'll ask you some questions. Let's go over them quickly. What does it mean to design for the common case? Well, this was bread and butter design or common case design, right? I guess this is a very open-ended question, right? You basically, uh, well, this is an example. I'll answer with an example. I won't wait for you. But if memory takes 90% of your execution time, and if you want to improve execution time in a system, Maybe you should be focusing on memory. That's what this says, right? Maybe do something that reduces that execution time that goes to memory. That's your common case in your programs. Right? Basically, focus on what is the bottleneck in your system. This, another way of thinking about it is really bottleneck-based design. Find the bottlenecks, reduce them, and something else becomes a bottleneck in your system. That's what common case is, OK? So don't optimize for exceptional cases, unless that exception takes a lot of time, in which case it may be common case. For example, uh, you can have a, uh, we haven't covered exceptions, but you will see that uh, the, the exceptions by definition don't occur very often, right? They're not the common case. For example, you don't get uh, divide by zero most of the time when you do a divide. Uh, so your you should not optimize for that case, but you should not make it a bottleneck also. Right? For example, if, whenever you get a divide by zero, if it takes 10 seconds to recover from that divide by zero, and you cannot do anything else for that 10 seconds, maybe there's a problem, right? Now you've turned an exceptional case into a bottleneck. So you should design, uh, your design should be aware such that exceptional cases do not affect the common case also. Okay? And these, this is also common sense, right? It's not something. Uh, unreasonable, but amazingly, when, uh, when you design machines, sometimes you have so much to do that you, you may actually do the mistakes. Maybe, maybe sometimes exceptions take too long, right? Like w when we discuss the interrupt uh, handling latency, right? Sometimes interrupt handling latency too long, it takes too long, and as a result, you get uh, uh, user dissatisfaction, right? Maybe you have not optimized for that exceptional case that's important still. Okay. How does the single cycle microarchitecture make the critical path design difficult? Remember what the cri critical path design was? Critical path is find what's affecting, uh, what's limiting, what's the bottleneck 
uh, for your cycle time and break, break it, reduce it, such that you minimize your cycle time. Right? How does a single cycle microarchitecture make it difficult? Yes? That's right, yeah. Basically, it doesn't give you a lot of freedom, right, in terms of optimizing that cycle. Because you have to be able to do everything specified by the worst possible instruction in one cycle. So you can keep on reducing it, but that everything in one cycle doesn't give you a lot of freedom. You still need to do that everything. OK? OK, I think I'll leave you with this. I'm not going to uh, answer this. But remember the performance equation that consists of three components. Execution time is equal to number of instructions times average cycles per instruction times the clock cycle time. Guess how can you improve each component in a multi-cycle microarchitecture? Multi-cycle microarchitecture gives you the ability to reduce the clock cycle as much as possible. Right? But it does come at the expense of increasing cycles per instruction now. So think about this while we cover uh, LC3B mi uh, multi-cycle microarchitecture today. But this is just, I'll just flash some of these slides to get you started. Critical path design, bread and butter, common case design, and balanced design were the three principles. And hopefully you'll know that by now. Multi-cycle microarchitectures. Let each instruction take only as much time as it really needs, right? That's the key idea. And I'll keep flashing these. So a quick review. Uh, we, we're going to talk about microprogramming, which is one form of multi-cycle microarchitecture. Uh, and the idea was uh, basically you divide the instruction processing cycle, which is this, fetch decode, evaluate address, fetch operands, execute, store result, into stages or states. Uh, and a stage in the instruction processing cycle can take multiple stage, uh, states. And a multi-cycle microarchitecture will basically sequence from state to state, right? And the behavior of the entire processor is specified fully by that finite state machine. And I think I should probably fire up this because we're going to use this quite a bit today. And yeah, don't forget to get your handouts if you, if you have come in late. OK, that's the lamp. OK. Anybody else need handouts? Okay, I'll take one, and you can distribute to others who need it. OK. OK, basically in a state or a clock cycle, the control signals control. You have these control signals. And the behavior of the machine in a given state is completely determined by those control signals. That's what defines a state. And it's the right display. OK. This is the state machine that we focused on last time, and we will keep focusing on. Can you guys see this? Or is there something wrong with the lighting? This better? Probably not. What do you think? Dark was better? This one? Oh, okay. Maybe if we do this, so we're learning. I'm learning how to use technology too. Is this better? No. <laughs> I thought there was a lamp here that just did this. For some reason, that lamp is not working. This is not that? OK. OK, now we have two lamps. That's OK. <laughs> All right, let me know if you cannot read it. But we'll try to focus and zoom and make it work. But you have, you have your handouts, too, so you can look from there, too. OK, basically, each state is defined by the control signals. And in a state, in a clock cycle, you have two components, data path and the control. Uh, the control signals control both, basically how the data path should process the data, and how to generate the control signals for the next clock cycle. 
how to sequence to the next state, basically. And just to brush up your terminology, microinstruction is, is the control signals associated with the current state. And the act of transitioning from one state to another is going from one microinstruction to the next microinstruction. It's called microsequencing. Right? And the control store which is a piece of memory that stores the control signals for every possible state. Basically, you have 31 states here. In your control store, we have 31 entries. Right? Basically, we have 31 microinstructions that fully specify the behavior of the state machine. And microsequencer, which is the control portion, determines which set of control signals will be used in the next clock cycle, which is the next state. Right. It sequences from microinstruction to microinstruction, or a location in the control store from, from one location to the next location. Right. That's the idea. And this is basically the, basically we've enabled control and data parallelism, right? Control processing is happening in parallel with the data path processing. You're figuring out the next state while you're doing stuff for the current state. Whereas you couldn't do that in a single cycle microarchitecture. That's very fundamental. OK, and we've covered this also, and I don't think I'm going to cover this again. But I think what we'll do is we'll go through an example of how to write microcode that will make it uh, much more clear. But this is where we left off, actually, in the last lecture. How many cycles does the fastest instruction take uh, if you look at the state machine? Well, it depends, right? If you look at this, uh, this is the fetch. You, this first three states are fetching instructions. And here's a memory access to fetch the instruction. And remember, this transition from the state 33 to 35 is conditional. Conditional upon whether the memory is ready at the end of the clock cycle. And memory may take, let's say, five clock cycles to become ready, which means that the processor stays in the state for five clock cycles. So this state takes one cycle, and there's an unconditional transition at the end of the clock cycle. One plus five plus one. Now you've spent seven cycles to fetch the instruction. Uh, why, does, why is this fetch the instruction? Well, basically, at this point, memory data register, the value in the memory data register goes into the instruction register. At this point, in the instruction register, you have the 16 instruction bits. OK? We'll, we'll come to this uh, when we actually do the microcoding. But you have seven cycles, one cycle to decode. And some operations take only one cycle, right? One cycle here for the add. You've decoded the instruction. It's an add. Next state is this. And this state basically do, does the ALU operation. So one, seven, one, five, one, one, one. That's nine cycles, right? So if your memory takes five cycles, the mi minimum number of uh, cycles you would take for any instruction is nine cycles. I guess how many cycles does the slowest instruction take? I'll let you determine. There are some instructions here that access memory multiple times, right? For example, the store word instruction. It accesses memory again over here. So you can calculate this. Okay? By looking at the state machine, you can answer these questions. Of course, there are some things that are unknown. Maybe memory takes variable number of cycles, right? Now you need to take that into account. OK, I think, uh, why does the branch take as long as it takes in the finite state machine? If you look at this, uh, this is the branch. Let's try to. By the way, this is the second page in your handout. So if I'm not zooming very well, you can look over there too. This is the branch, right? At the end of the decode state, uh, if the opcode is branch, we jump to this state. And there is a branch enable bit that's checked. Here. And branch enable, if you remember, uh, it was set to 1 if the branch is going to be taken. And I'll let you figure out uh, how that is done. Or maybe we'll, we'll get back to it. But why does it take as long as it takes? So here, if the branch is not taken, you go to the next state, which is basically the next instruction. But if the branch is taken, then you go to a state where program counter is loaded with the target of the branch. And that is determined, the next state is determined whether, uh, based on whether or not the branch is enabled or branch should be taken or not, which is computed here. You can see that branch enable bit is set by looking at the condition codes and checking if the condition code that's, that the branch is testing uh, is set or not. 
Right? That's what this logic is. Everybody clear on this? OK. You, you can shout if you're not clear, and we'll go into more detail. And don't be afraid to do that, by the way. I can go f fast sometimes. Uh, OK, in this case, well, you set the branch enable bit here. You check the branch enable bit here. And based on that, you go to the next state. Well, why didn't we do, why didn't we have a single state to do this? As a designer, you could have a single state that does both, right? Is that not true? You could check the branch enable here, and you could have, you could load the PC within the single state. If the branch enable is set, then load the PC. Otherwise, don't load the PC. Right? That could have been your state. But now somebody, whoever designed the state machine, uh, broke that up into two states. This is actually for more education. They brought it, up, brought it into two states. But the reason is branch enable is a control signal, basically. It's really controlling what will happen in this current cycle, right? So it would potentially lengthen the clock cycle if you actually use that in the same clock cycle. Does that make sense? So here, branch enable is used only for, uh, only for the purpose of determining the next state. This may not be the best example, because that, that calculation of branch enable is very short, right? It doesn't take very long. But you can imagine other control signals that we will see. Uh, so this state machine is a design. It's your design, for example. It's someone's design. You can decide to merge states, or you can decide to have more states. Right? And the decisions you make affect the clock cycle as well as cycles per instruction. OK, what determines the clock cycle? Basically, the state that takes the longest right, in terms of your critical path. And I'll let you uh, think about this. I've given you the answer probably last time. But is this a Mealy machine or a Moore machine? Moore machine? <laughs> well, I'll let you think about it. Maybe this could be a homework question, actually. <laughs> Let's add it to the homework. <laughs> yeah? OK. OK, so data path, uh, we've looked at this briefly, but uh, this is, uh, let me, this is the data path we're going to uh, be microcoding or microprogramming. This is the next, oh, that's not what I wanted. Zoom is the one. Yeah, this is the next page, third page in your handout. But this is basically the microarchitecture uh, of LC3B. And it's a single bus data path design. If you look at this, there's a single bus uh, in bold that enables communication between data path elements. It's also called interconnect. Right? And there could be multiple different kinds of interconnect, but there's a single bus here. We don't have multiple buses. <coughs> the advantage, well, which means that at any, at any point, only one value can be on the bus, right? And if you look at this, uh, there, are, there are values that we may want to gate on the bus. For example, uh, let's take a look at the this is where multiple of these comes in handy. Uh, let's take a look at the first state here. What does the first state specify? First state tells us that program counter should go to the memory address register in that first state. And also, we should increment the program counter by two. Because we're going to fetch, uh, we, we want to put the program counter into the memory address register because we're going to fetch from that location the instruction bytes. Well, how do you put the program counter into the memory address register? If you look at this, data path has a program counter here. And memory address register is located here. If we want program counter to go on to the memory address register, we need to use this bus. Right? There is no direct connection between the program counter and memory address register. There is a common bus. Uh, and this, this common, common bus can be, uh, can have, uh, you can gate different potential values onto this bus. Program counter is one of them. So to be able to do what this state specifies that you cannot see anymore over there, we need to enable this gate PC signal. Right? 
this gate PC basically connects this wire from the program counter onto the bus. You guys are familiar with tri-state buffers? It's essentially a tri-state buffer. Right? If that gate PC is set to one, uh, the input wire in front of that state tri-state buffer is connected to the output wire such that the output is the same as the input. If that gate PC is set to zero, then the output is in high impedance state. Right? The input doesn't affect the output. Okay, so to be able to load the bus, we enable the gate PC. This should be set to one, so that signal in that state should be set to one. That's a control signal. At, and now, program counter can flow, but then there could be multiple destinations, right? What destination are we going to load? We're going to load memory address register. So this load memory address register should be set to one in the same cycle also. And at the end of the cycle, the value on the bus will be latched onto the memory address register. Make sense? So while we're doing this, we cannot use the bus for anything else, right? At the same time, for example, uh, we cannot gate the result of the ALU. In fact, if you, you should not set the gate ALU signal to one at the same time because now there are multiple things, multiple different wires that would be connected to the bus or gated onto the bus, which means that you'll get some garbage value, right? Make sense? Because they will do chart sharing in very differently. OK, so basically we're, we're kind of micro, micro coding the first state now. Gate PC should be set to 1. All of the other gating signals that uh, gate a value onto the bus should be set to 0, which means gate uh, marmux should be set to 0, gate ALU result should be set to 0, and gate the shifter result should be set to 0. Right? And these are different components of the data bot. What is MAR MUX? Well, that determines your address, right? MAR MUX, uh, another uh, value that could be loaded into MAR. And we'll see when it's used. When you do a load, you compute the address, and uh, you gate the address onto the bus such that it's loaded into the MAR, such that you can do the memory operation. Okay? At any point, only one value can be gated on the bus which means that you cannot do multiple concurrent operations. Advantage, low hardware cost. We briefly talked about this, right? You have a single bus. It's actually beautiful. Uh, now, you could actually take this to the even uh, uh, more extreme, right? I guess I'll give you the answer to what's, what the next question that's coming later on. But here, if you look at this, uh, this state also specifies PC plus 2 should be, set to, uh, should be loaded into the PC. Right? Which means that you need to have hardware that can do these two operations concurrently. While you're loading PC into the MAR register, memory address register, you should also increment the PC. Well, incrementing the PC goes through this incrementer, right? If you look at this, you get program counter, that's program counter plus two, specialized incrementer, and that goes through this PC mux. And in this state, uh, the control signals should be set, this, uh, this control signal should be set such that this input, PC plus 2 input, is selected by the PC mux because we're going to load PC plus 2 into the PC. And load PC also should be set such that at the end of the clock cycle, at the end of the state, program counter is loaded. This is the write enable signal for the register, for the program counter register. So this happens concurrently with the transfer on the bus. Well, somebody ma made the choice that you have a specialized interconnect to load the PC, right? You did not have to do that, right? You could have used the ALU to increment the PC, right? Now you have a specialized ALU, uh, specialized incrementer. Which means that this is not a minimal hardware cost design. So if you had used the ALU to increment the PC in the same clock cycle, now let's see what we need to do. There needs to be some connection between the program counter and the ALU. I guess there is no connection right now. right? So you will need some way of connecting this program counter. Let's say you really want to minimize hardware. What you need to do is perhaps gate the PC also onto the bus, and 
the bus somehow gets connected to the ALU, and ALU picks the operation PC plus 2, and the result of the ALU should be gated onto the bus. Well, I guess you cannot do those in the same cycle, right? You cannot gate the input to the ALU as well as the output from the ALU in the same cycle. That's why you need a special path from the program counter to the ALU. But let's say we have that special path and we increment the PC in the ALU. Now you need to gate the ALU output onto the bus in the same cycle where you would like to place PC into the MAR. Right? Well, that cannot happen. Right? That's why you have the specialized incrementer here, because we want to do that in the same cycle. Right? Make sense? Now the OK. Actually, you don't have to increment the PC in this cycle, right? There's no reason why you should uh, increment the PC in this particular state. It's just a choice here. What you can do is increment the PC in some other state, in the latest state, for example, at the very end. Or you could increment the PC here, as long as you do it only once, not five times, while you're waiting for the memory. Or you could increment the PC in the decode stage, right, or here. So you have this choice of when to do the things if you have a state machine. OK. So this advantage of this is, of course, you have reduced concurrency, as I showed you, right? Uh, you, cannot do more, you cannot load more than one thing onto the bus. And if you need to, you need to have uh, different states to do that. OK. And control signals, 26 of them that we've seen before, determine what happens in the data path in one clock cycle. And if you look at this, I don't think it's in your handouts, but Appendix C, Table C.1. This is the table you were referring to, right? These are the control signals that completely specify uh, what happens in a single cycle. I guess let's take some examples. We've already looked at one of them, right? Load MAR, for example, that decides whether MAR is loaded or not loaded. Let's, uh, these are uh, symbolic values. No means load MAR is not set to 1, or MAR should not be loaded, memory address register. Load means it should be loaded. And you can assign 0 and 1, right? Let's assign 0 to no's. Somehow people think that it's more logical that no is a 0 and yes is a 1. Is that true for you guys? False is a 0 and true is a 1. But it's a convention, right, that we use as people. It's not really set in stone. But let's, I guess let's not break that convention. Let's say no is a 1 uh, and yes is, uh, no is a 0 and yes is a 1. There are other control signals, right? Load PC, we've already seen. Load PC uh, is set if the program counter is to be loaded at the end of that cycle, at the end of that state. And it's not set if it's not to be loaded. And we've seen gate PC. Should the program counter be gated onto the bus? No, yes. We've seen uh, PC mux, right? This is the program counter mux that selects what value the program counter should be loaded with. It could be incremented, and in the first state it should be incremented. That's what the first state specifies. But the program counter can take its value from different places, right? In this case, it's taking it from the bus. You can select the bus, input, and that's needed for some instruction. What instruction could that be? Any guesses? What could come from the bus? I guess you can think of it that way, right? What could come from the bus? Register file output can come from the bus, right? And if you're doing a jump, maybe you're jumping to a register. Memory. Memory. Yeah, if you're, if you're Program counter, uh, if your next address in the program counter is determined by somewhere in memory, you could get uh, data from MDR, memory data register. And memory data register has a connection to the bus, right? You, you load the MDR onto the bus, and it could go to the program counter. Now, it turns out in LC3B ISA, there is no instruction that loads the program counter with a memory address. Um, with, a, with, a, uh, with a data value coming from memory. So that won't work. But you could add an instruction, right? That's, that would enable that. Or uh, the program counter can also 
be loaded with a value that's coming from this output of this adder. I guess what is that output of the adder? Well, this, is, this looks like a mess, right? <laughs> well, this is here to enable different instructions, right? Uh, for example, basically this adder is adding this input to this input. What is this input? This input comes, could come from the program counter. You could take the program counter and you could select the program counter here and add to it a left shifted sign extended immediate. And that sign extended immediate could be the bottom 11 bits of the instruction register or bottom nine bits of the instruction register or the bottom six bits of the instruction register or the bottom five bits of the instruction register. And depending on which instruction you're executing, you pick one of these. Right? So this address two mux determines uh, which input you select to this, uh, you, uh, you select with this mux. And that is dependent on the instruction you're executing. Right? Okay, we'll, we'll see some examples of this. Uh, yes? As far as how the uh, values given in, in table C1 uh, mm -hmm. actually, re actually, actually relate to the numerical values the select lines for the months, is PC plus two zero at bus one and how would two? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, there's nothing specified here, but yes, you could, you could treat it that way. In the, in the homework question, we, we should treat it that way, right? That should be well specified. But uh, there's nothing specified here, but tre treat this as 0, 1, uh, 2, 1, 0. Well, in this case, it's two bits, right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And I guess 1, 1 is almost like I don't care. Yes? So should we just assume that convention for everything the first one is, is zero? That's right. Yes, when you're filling out the microcode table. Okay. And my TAs will verify that and ensure that that's the case. OK, any other questions? Yes? Um, back on the previous slide where it had um, all the address sections. Here? Yeah, yeah, yeah that one. Does everyone read the bottom five bits for the sign extended? Oh, but oh yeah, there is no input here. That's yeah, right. I was just making sure that uh -huh. there was like a mistake on the diagram. No, no, that's, uh, here you're getting zero as the input. And there must be an instruction that uses that. And you'll figure, you'll figure that out when you write the microcode. I'm not going to give you all the answers. But you're right. I made a mistake. This is not connected to this mux. This is really connected here. And this is the sign extend immediate, actually, if you remember, uh, that an add operation needs that goes to ALU. OK. OK, you'll have fun looking at this in more detail. But this is your data path. This is the same thing. Uh, and data path also, this data path is not fully specified. If you look at this, there are some blocks. Maybe let's look at this since this, we've, we've zoomed in. Uh, there are some blocks that are not specified here. So in your appendix, you'll see those blocks. For example, the source register 2. Uh, well, it comes actually from a mux. And that mux is, oh, do we have that in the handouts? Yeah, we have it. Well, source register 2 is not a mux, actually, because there is only one potential place where source register 2 can come from, but source register 1 comes from a mux. Depending on the instruction, your source register 1 can be the uh, 9 through 11 bit, 11th bits of the instruction register, or it can be uh, the address of source register 1 can be the 6th through 8th bits of the instruction register, right? depending on your instruction again, which means that in, that, in a particular state, your control signals for SR1 mux is determined by what type of instruction it is that you're executing. This is very, very similar to the single cycle design that, you're, uh, that we've discussed earlier, right? Depending on the type of the instruction, your destination register is different. Uh, the destination register ID comes from different bits of your instruction or source register ID. Okay? But these are also parts of the data path. And here is the branch enable logic that's also part of the data path. Branch enable bit is set, this is a register. This is set based on the outcome of this logic. And the outcome of the logic is determined. Uh, maybe we'll take a look at this since we keep coming back to branch enable. And the outcome of the log logic is determined based on the execution of the branch. And what is the execution of the branch and tail? Basically, you have these condition codes from NZP registers, that's part of the architectural state. 
And the branch checks, if you look at the operation of the branch here, it's specified such that this is the branch encoding, and you have these NZP bits, bits 11 through 9, and hence you have in the data path bits 11 through 9 coming from the instruction register. And the branch operation is specified as if the N bit in the instruction set, if the branch is testing the condition that uh, the value is negative, and if the condition code is negative, set by some other instruction, or if the branch is testing the Z condition and the Z condition is true, or if the branch is testing the P condition and if, and if the P condition is true, then the branch should be taken, right? Which means that the branch is enabled. Make sense? And somebody else already uh, set the condition codes. And this logic basically implements that. So you know what that logic does now. It's basically this, right? Branch enable equals this uh, condition, the computation of that condition. OK? So it's pretty simple. Which means that you will need this ISA also when you're uh, thinking about uh, this ISA handout, which is Appendix A, when you're filling out your microcode. OK. We, we will get back to, uh, this, is a, this is a choice that the designers made in the ISA, including condition codes, right? And we will get back to that when we cover pipelining. This is not the only way. You don't necessarily need to have these specialized condition code registers in your ISA, right? It's a specialized register, if you think of it. Right, you have NZP, that's architectural, that's specialized, that just says the last value that was written by an instruction that sets the condition codes was negative, zero, or positive. Do we have that in MIPS? No, right? MIPS doesn't have condition codes. MIPS uses the general purpose registers to branch. And there are instructions that operate on general purpose registers, and branch instructions check those registers. So this is also uh, condition codes. These are, uh, this is an example of a side effect of an instruction. This doesn't have a very great definition, probably. But basically, you're modifying some specialized registers with the instruction. It's not only that you're modifying potentially uh, a general purpose register, but you're also modifying a specialized register by setting these condition codes. The good part is you always do this computation, right? Which means that you don't, have, you don't need a separate instruction to, set, uh, to compare. MIPS needs a separate instruction to compare, right? Well, I guess branches can compare also. With condition codes, you always know for an instruction that sets the condition code whether the result was negative, zero, or positive. It's always computed. What does this mean? Always extra work. I guess the upside is you don't need a, no need for a separate instruction. to uh, compare the value to negative, zero, or positive. Downside, extra work. And when you, have, when you don't need that value, you still need to do it, right? The hardware still needs to do that comparison to negative, zero, or positive. And you can think about a uh, comparison to zero. That does take some work to do, right? What is the what is the simplest co zero comparator you can uh, design? I'll let you think about it. Uh, the so there's an upside and there's a downside. If you don't need the condition code, you're still doing the extra work. Anyway, that was an aside for condition codes versus compare instructions. Right? There are multiple ways of handling branches. OK, so let's get back to uh, the data path now. OK, we've covered these other data path structures. 
And there are some others also that uh, you need to figure out. And these are the data path control signals. These are the control signals that control the data path. I think we've covered some of this. How does instruction fetch happen in this data path according to the state machine? I think we'll see that when we do microcoding uh, for an instruction. What is the difference between gating and loading? This is it's actually something important. It's pretty simple. But I use, I use the term gating when a value is gated onto the bus. right? And the term loading is used when a register is loaded with a value. In a sense, you're loading some hardware. Right? Why not call them the same? The difference is gating happens throughout the cycle, right? Whereas loading, you are latching a value at the end of the clock cycle. Right? That's, that's the assumption I'm going to make. Okay? A, a register is loaded at the end of the clock cycle, but while you're gating the value, it's gated during the clock cycle, which means that you can use the full value of the register during the clock cycle before it's loaded. I guess this question came a little bit later than I thought. <laughs> is this the smallest hardware you can design, this data path? No. You can do better, right? Yeah. We've, already, yeah. we've already covered a case where you don't need this adder, perhaps, right? There are actually multiple adders here. You could use only a single adder. But uh, the designer of this data path decided to use multiple adders to improve concurrency, to do multiple things at a time. OK, let's look at the control structure, and then we'll uh, do microcoding. Because you need to know both the data path and the control to be able to do the, write the microcode, right? Uh, if you look at the control structure, uh, this, is, this is basically our control structure. Right? Actually, let me give you the high-level picture first. If you look at the first uh, page of your handout, remember we looked at the data path now. We don't look at control as much. Now let's take a look at what's in this control structure. This control signal is the micro instruction for the current cycle. And this is what the control instruction looks like. This is also in your handouts. No, oh, I guess that's the most we can zoom out. Basically, you have a micro sequencer. Uh, well, uh, that determines. The, uh, the next address that you're going to go into the control store, which is the next state. You want to fetch the micro instruction for the next state, which is an entry in the control store, which means that micro sequencer should give you the address of the next state, address of that micro instruction. And in the mean, uh, well, in a clock cycle, you determine that address, you access the control store to get the micro instruction. And at the end of the clock cycle, you have the micro instruction, which specifies the control signals for the next cycle. Right. That's the idea. So this all happens in a single clock cycle. I think I've given you all of them. Micro instruction uh, control signals that control the data path. This goes to the data path. And these nine control signals are fed back to the micro sequencer because they help determine the next state. And each micro instruction is stored in a unique location in the control store. Unique location is the address of the state corresponding to the micro instruction. And each, remember, this is important. Each state corresponds to one micro instruction. And micro sequencer determines the address of that micro instruction, which is the next state. Well, I guess I have it here also. And since we have 31 states, we have 64 entries. Right? I guess why do we have 64 entries? Do we have 31 states? Because state encoding happen to have six bits, right? Exactly. That's or you could, have ex you could extend it, actually. It's, it's going to become more later on and, uh, when we talk about interrupt exception handling. And this is the micro sequencer. And we've gone through this a little bit uh, earlier. This, the output is the address of the next state. And the input is things coming from the current micro instruction. And you could jump unconditionally to the next state. Uh, and remember, we discussed this. This is the state 
this IRD bit selects this input in the decode state. And if you remember, the decode state is state uh, number 32. And in that case, the next state address in the micro, uh, in the control, uh, control store is determined by the opcode. Otherwise, the next state address is here. And you could have a conditional decision uh, made uh, by this microsequencer to determine what is the next address, what is the address of the next uh, micro instruction, right? And that conditional decision, mm, let me see, let's keep this here. Basically here, your address of the next state could be dependent on, for example, whether the memory is ready or not in this state. Or whether the branches, branch enable bit is set or not, right? Or whether uh, your instruction register 11 is set or not. Like where does that happen? Can you guys find that? Uh, I guess I'll let you find that because you'll eventually find that. There you go. Here it is. Based on IR11, remember IR11 uh, was, a, was an example of bit steering in jump to subroutine, right? Depending on whether IR11 is set to 1 or 0, the address computed by the jump to subroutine instruction that will be placed in the program counter is different. It could be from a base register or it could be from PC plus offset. And that determines how you compute your address. And here, the next state when you're executing this instruction is determined based on IR11. Right. And there's a state that tests IR11 and next state is determined based on that value. Okay? Which means that, let's say you're, you're in this state. In this state, somehow your J bits should specify, uh, okay, if IR11 is 1, you should go to state 21. If IR11 is 0, you should go to state 20. Which means that the person who writes the microcode should ensure that, first of all, this input is selected as the address of the next state, which means that IRD should be 0. Second, uh, the condition, because this state transition, the address of the next state is conditional upon IR11, these bits are set, the condition bits, which are part of the micro instruction, are set such that only this bit affects the next state. And how do you do that? You set both condition 1 and condition 0 to 1, right? If you do 1, 1, then this AND gate will pass IR11. And it will, it will not pass any of these. And now, now you set condition 1 and condition 0 to 1, 1. And now how do you set the J bits? J bits are also part of your micro instruction. If IR11 is 0, then your next state should be 20. Right? That's the address of the next state, which means that your J bits should be set such that they specify 20. And what is that 20? I guess 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. Right? And if IR11 is 1, this bit will become 1. This output will become 1 because uh, this will evaluate to 1, so you'll get 21 as the next state address. Make sense? So what we've done is really we're branching. This is, like, this is also called a micro branch, if you will. The next state, next micro instruction, is determined based on, the, based on a condition that happens in the mic, uh, micro architecture. You're really branching to a different location in the control store based on something that's happening in the machine. So it's a micro branch, basically, a micro architectural branch to a next location. And you will see this term, actually. Existing machines, uh, a lot of Intel and x86 machines have this micro branch depending on uh, What's happening in the mi current micro instruction, they branch to one location or another location in the control store. And we will see that you could actually feed these micro instructions into a pipeline 
And you will still need to predict these micro branches. <laughs> anyway, if you haven't understood that, uh, that's okay. But this is, you could, this is very similar to a, a branch, but it's, it's at the microarchitectural level, right? It's not at the architectural level. Okay. Well, and this is the control store, right? This is what control store contains. Basically, uh, the full micro instruction, full values of 35 bits for every single possible state. And this is what you're going to fill. It's not that many bits, right? 35 times 31. Yes? For the cases of all the states after 31, does it matter what those values are? Oh, no. It, it, well, I guess uh, I don't know how we specified it in the assignments. Maybe they should be x's, but it, it really doesn't matter as long as you don't jump to those states, right? OK. OK, so that's the microsequencer. Uh, we've already talked about this. The next address, uh, the address of the next state depends on nine control signals, which we've talked about, right? The IRD, it could be set or not set. And this is only set in that decode state. The condition bits, which condition, on which condition are you actually deter, uh, determining the next state? It could be unconditional. And there are many states here where the next state is unconditional. For example, here, the next state is unconditionally 33, which means that your J bits, which is the address of the next state, assuming the transition is unconditional, should be set to 33 while you're in this state. Now let's do this microprogramming a little bit. Uh, I guess I'll skip these because I'm going to ask this uh, later on again. Okay, so these are the figures. You can, you can actually find your handout online also. Uh, which, which, which instructions do you guys want to microprogram? Let's do, this. Let's do the fetch state first, which is going to be easy. So what we're going to do is, uh, we're going to write the microcode for some of these states to get you started on your homework and to hopefully solidify some of the concepts. And we'll start with this fetch state, which we've already started a little bit. So what we need is a lot of things. We definitely need the state machine that specifies the behavior of the machine. And this is our program, basically. We're going to make sure this machine works, I hope. And if you write a mistake in this microcode, if you make a mistake in this microcode, then your machine won't work, right? <laughs> it's just like software. And we'll see that this is very much like software, actually. Uh, OK, uh, what are we going to do? Uh, the first state, uh, well, we also need the data path, which means that I'd like to open another one here. OK. First state, state 18, right? Encoding is uh, state 18 or 19. Let's do it only for 18. Uh, first, we find where 18 is. This is state 18. And you guys can see it, right? Now let's, let's first figure out what's happening in the data path. The state specifies that program counter should go to memory address register, right? And let me know if you cannot see these. Now we need to enable the control signals Set the control signals that ensure that happens, right? Program counter goes to memory address register. And we already looked at this, so you should be familiar. We somehow need to, uh, let me do this. We somehow need to take the program counter, load it onto the bus, which means that gate PC should be one, right? So I go to my micro, micro code, find out where gate PC is, it's here, and state 18, Gate PC should be 1. Wow, this requires good eyes. <laughs> OK. So you gate the program counter onto the bus. That's 1. Well, you'd better gate nothing else onto the bus in the same cycle, which means that all of the other signals that gate stuff onto the bus, gate MAR mux, gate ALU, gate shift, should be 0. Right? Uh, let's see. Well, there is also gate MDR. MDR can also load the bus, obviously, which is here, right? Which means that when you're getting data from memory, you load it onto the bus and place it into a register later on. So this should also be zero. All of the signals, other signals that gate data onto the bus should be zero. Gate MDR, gate ALU, gate MARMUX, gate shift. 
That was easy. Right. So now this ensures that program counter is on the bus. Now, where, where were we going to load it? Well, if you forgot, the state machine says it should go into MAR, memory address register, because we're going to fetch uh, the data or the instruction that's at that location at the program count, specified by the program counter. So the bus is now loaded safely. This should go into MAR. MAR is here. Well, how do we load the MAR? At the end of the clock cycle, the value on the bus should get latched onto MAR, which means that this LDMAR signal should be 1. And where is LDMAR? We find LDMAR. Well, it conveniently is the first signal that controls the data path, at least. That is 1. OK? Uh, let's see. The state also specifies that program counter should be incremented by 2. Right? If you look at this, that PC gets PC plus 2 at the same time. So how do we do that? Well, we've already looked at this, right? Which you have this logic that increments the program counter. And you should select this one in this cycle. So a PC mux should select PC plus 2. And what is that? How do we do that? Well, what is the value? This is where the questions that were asked over there are very relevant. Uh, if you look at this, this PC mux can get its value from three different places. When I'm zooming. It can get its value from PC plus 2. It can get its value from the bus. And it can get its value from the address adder. And we're going to select PC plus 2. And assuming we assign values, and this is a 2-bit two, two control signal. That's what PC mux uh, slash 2 means. So we're going to assign values 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, this way. Which means that PC mux should be set to 0, 0. And if you look at PC mux, that's a control signal here. That should be set to 0, 0, right? So now we program the PC mux's control signals. But we also need to load the PC. Oh, I guess you guys cannot see. I zoomed in too much. I'll zoom out. There should be an automatic zoom in, right? If I'm actually pointing to PC mux and this is not showing PC mux to you. <laughs> that can be detected. <laughs> OK, anyway, uh, this PC uh, should be loaded, which means that that load PC signal should be set to 1. So I find the load PC signal and set it to 1 here. OK? And the state specifies that no register. Well, let's go back to the state machine. Hmm. No other register should be loaded, which means that, well, the load signals for the other registers should be all zeros, right? MDR should not be loaded. Instruction register should not be loaded. I guess while we're looking at it, let's take a look at where these things are so that you get uh, familiarized with them. I guess I picked the wrong buttons. MDR is here. This state has nothing to do with loading uh, data from memory into the memory data register or register into the memory data register. So load MDR should be set to 0, right? Similarly, instruction register should not be loaded because now we, we, ha we don't have anything on the bus that should be loaded into the instruction register, right? Actually, maybe the results can be don't care around here, right? Maybe you do load the instruction register with the value on the bus you're, as long as you're not going to use it later on, right? So it's OK if you set it to 0. It's OK if you set it to x, as long as it works, right? It's probably better to set it to 0. Why load a register when you don't need the value, right? I guess what, does that make sense? If you set, if you set the value to 1 in this case, or x, don't care, what will happen is your uh, instruction register may be loaded with what's on the bus. Well, what's on the bus? What's on the bus is PC, right? The program counter, the value of the program counter. It makes no sense to load the value of the program counter into the instruction register. But you could, because the next state is not going to use that. Eventually, you're going to overwrite the instruction register. So this value actually can be 1. But we're going to set it to 0 because you get some energy savings by not loading your register, right? You're not changing the contents of your register. So the decisions you make impact energy also, even though they maybe don't care in terms of correctness or performance. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, 
wouldn't there be an advantage to setting it to don't care though? Because it would make, <coughs> if, say, however you encode your finite state machine, like, maybe you break it down with like find the cost theory or something. Maybe you break it down with? So in 240, we would implement a finite state machine with like, um, uh -huh. That's right, yeah. So you can minimize your logic, you're right. saying. So the don't care is like would help a lot when you're, what are the name of the things? The, the Boolean. Yeah, you, you can minimize your k-maps, for example, right? You're probably thinking of Karnow maps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Not in this case. Why? Because not, our, our, our control signal is stored here, right? We're storing the control signal. Here. We're not generating the control signals via hardware logic. If we were generating them via hardware, hardwired logic, yes. Is that ever an alternative? It could be, yes. But we have a control store now. The control signal directly comes from there. But if you, were, if you were looking at this as a combinational control, you have some inputs and you have some outputs, and your inputs will be different in that case. It won't be the, exactly the same inputs. Then using don't care is a very, very good idea. Because now you can minimize that hardware, uh, hardwired logic. But not here. But you have a great point. OK, so, uh, and so I'm not going to load registers unnecessarily, which means I'm going to set the load signals for the branch enable register, uh, load re uh, signal for the register file, and the condition codes to 0. OK, what else is left? Well. Uh, Let's look at other data path elements. We have DR mux, SR1 mux, address mux, address2 mux, MAR mux, ALUK. Do we need those elements? Well, let's take a look at some of them. Uh, DR mux. You won't see the DR mux. But we're not loading the register file, which means that the destination register of the register file is irrelevant, the address, right? We should not, uh, at this point, we're, we should not change the register file. And that's not a don't care in this case. You don't want to load the register file with anything, right? Because that changes your architectural state. That should be a zero. Now, do you care about what the RMUX, which is the uh, MUX that's right before this, which determines the destination register ID, uh, what the control signals for that MUX is? Well, you don't care, right? If you look at that, it could come from 111 which means that the destination register is 7. And if you remember, there are cases where the destination register of an instruction is 7. Jump to subroutine, right? When you're jumping to subroutine, you're linking the next program counter to register 7. You're storing the next program counter to register 7. So at that point, you should select this. But not in this state. This state is state 18, right? The state does nothing with the destination register. So you don't really care about what this DRMUX signal is, right? So you could set it to anything, really. But I'm going to set it to X. I guess in the control store, you have to set it to something. It should be 0 or 1, right? You don't, want to, you, you don't have three values. We don't have three-valued logic here. It's, so, but I'll, I'll set it to X here, saying, uh, indicating that it doesn't matter. And I'll set SR1 mux to X also. And SR1 mux is similar because we're not sourcing a register. We don't really care. Right? And I'll set address 1 mux and address 2 mux. Oh, let's see. Let's see what those are before setting them to X. You've got to be careful because if you do something wrong, the instruction will execute wrong, right? The state will be wrong. What is the address 1 mux and address 2 mux? Well, if you look at this, uh, the address 1 mux is here. Its output goes to this adder, and it's, the adder's output goes to a PC mux, but we're not selecting this output. So in, from this point of view, we don't care what this address 1 mux is. right? But the output of this adder that's fed by address 1 mux also goes to MAR mux, which could potentially be selected. But we're not gating the value that comes out of MAR mux onto the bus, which means that this value we don't really care about. Which means that address 1 mux can be uh, this control signal that selects between this input or this input of address 1 mux can be anything again. Well, it looks like I already made it anything before verifying that. Not a good thing to do. <laughs> when you're designing a machine, make sure that it works. <laughs> OK? 
So this x is correct in this case, but I was lucky. Address 2 mux, you do a similar thing, right? Address 2 mux, the output goes into this left shifter. It goes into this adder, and we've already verified that this output of the adder doesn't matter in this state because we're not loading. Uh, this gate MAR mux is set to 0, and we're not selecting this input to the PC mux, which means that we can safely set these to x's. MAR mux, well, we've already, MAR mux is this one. This control signal, again, doesn't matter because we're not gating MAR mux's output onto the bus, so that should be x. ALUK, what is ALUK? If, that's another control signal. ALUK, if you look at this, is ALU control. It tells you how to control the ALU. What should the ALU do? Well, again, the output of the ALU is gated. And we're not, we, we set this to 0, so it doesn't matter again. ALUK is x, x. Now there's MION. Now this may matter. Let's take a look at what it is. MION is here, if we zoom in, it basically goes into this address control logic, which you will learn about once you read Appendix C. It basically says, should the memory or I.O. be enabled or not? In this case, in this state, we're not accessing memory yet, right? We're going to load uh, the memory address register with the program counter's contents. But we're not going to access memory yet. Memory access is going to happen in this state, which means that memory or I.O. should not be enabled. Right? You'd better set that to 0 so that you don't cause trouble with memory. Read write r.w. What is that signal? Uh, what is that signal? If you look at this, read write goes here. This is the signal. And this tells you whether the memory access is a read or write. Well, in this case, we're not doing a memory access, right? So that should be set to. We don't care, right? If memory I.O. is not enabled, that read write, we don't care about. Although, again, we should be careful, right? Yes? Is memory I.O. just control memory mapped I.O., or is it control, is it like turning off any memory operation? Which one? M.I.O.N.? Yeah. So it, it turns off any memory operation here, OK? Yeah. So. If you, if you read Appendix C, you'll see that this enables uh, this entire part. And this one of the outputs is memory enabled. Yeah. I, I, was, yeah. I read it, but I thought it was just that. Oh, I see. I see. That, yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could design in different ways. So what happens is, just to give you an idea, this is memory mapped I.O. You get an address from MAR. And the question is, should you access memory or should you address I.O.? Well. There is even an earlier gating signal that says, should you even care? And that's what memory I.O. enable is. You don't care because you're not going to access memory or I.O. because you're not in a state uh, where you do memory or I.O. access. And because this is memory mapped I.O., this address control logic checks the address. It compares MAR to the address of the keyboard, keyboard data register, keyboard status register, I guess display data register, display status register. And if that's the case, if the address range is within the range of the keyboard and display, then these things are enabled. Otherwise, a memory access is enabled. That's the idea of the memory mapped I.O. OK, but we're not going to enable memory uh, at all here, uh, which means that read write actually can be x. Data size, what is data size? This basically determines. Uh, the size of the data that you're going to load from or write into memory. Again, we're not enabling memory at all. Uh, not enabling memory at all means that you're not going to, this, this signal is 0, which means that memory will not be read, to, read from or written to, which means that the data size also doesn't matter. Although you've got to be, again, careful, right? Because data size input goes into many places here. And we'll learn about this also. So for example, this logic determines, it takes into account data size. And when you do a load byte, this logic moves the data such that the byte is at the uh, least significant byte of the 16-bit word. But here, again, we don't care in the state because we're not gating the output of MDR, output of all of memory, onto the bus, right? which means that data size, again, 
can be don't care. Left shift one, well, what is that? Left shift one is somewhere here on the data path. And it determines whether this address coming out of this address two max is left shifted. And again, we established that we don't care because the output of this adder doesn't go anywhere. Anywhere we care about in this state at least. We're not going to load it anywhere. OK? So these are the control signals that are control the data path in this particular state, state 18. Now you can copy this to state 19 also because state 18 and state 19 are the same. Now let's take a look at what are the control signals that determine uh, control processing. Remember these nine control signals? They determine the control processing that happens in the microsequencer. And yeah, just to refresh your memory, these are the control signals. Now we're going to set these nine control signals. How are we going to do that? We're going to look at the state machine again. And where's my microsequencer? And look at these two things together. We know that the next state address is unconditionally 33, right? Which means that j bits should specify 33 unconditionally. And what is 33? This is 32. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Those are the j bits. Now we know that this transition is unconditional, which means that the condition bits should be set to 0, 0, right? If you set them to 0, 0, none of these, uh, these uh, the output of these AND gates will be 0. They won't be dependent on any of these conditions. So these two condition bits are 0, 0. And we should select the J bits, because we're not in the decode state, right? So you've got that already. And what, uh, selecting the J bits means that the IRD signal, if you look at the microsequencer signals from uh, Appendix C again, IRD signal should be no. No meaning don't choose uh, the next state based on uh, this 16 way jump. Okay? And that's our microcode, micro instruction for that state. State 18. That was simple, right? <laughs> is, it, is it all clear now to everyone? Yeah? Yes? With regards to the conditional control signal, is setting that to 1 um, meaning, how would that work exactly if you weren't going to set it to something like 0? Uh, say it again. The condition signals? Yes. Yeah. So maybe we should look at the next state. Do you guys want to program the next state also? Mm -hmm. Yes, because that will enable you to look at, the, look at how the conditional thing works. I'm going to do this for two or three states, and then the rest is yours. Is that a good deal? It's a lot of fun <laughs> once you get the hang of it. <laughs> it's like programming. OK, let's look at the next state. Next state is a little bit uh, more difficult, because now we're going to access memory, and there are multiple things going on here, multiple things meaning the jump is conditional. Uh, by the way, I'll just keep going. We won't take a break. I'll make it up to you for some other time. <laughs> but if you look at this, the next state is 33. So we're going to write the microcode for state 33. And what's happening with state 33? Let's go back to the data path. Basically, this says memory. We're going to do a memory access, and memory is going to load the memory data register. Well. Because we've already loaded the memory address register in the previous state or previous cycle, now we're going to access memory. And the hope is that at some point, uh, after some point, memory will respond. So if you look at this, memory address register will be input into the memory. We should not write enable memory, uh, but we should enable memory, which means that we should read from memory. And the data of memory will come. That's why we need this automatic detection mechanism. The output of the memory will come. We should select this output from memory. And it should go into this MUX. So we should select that. And memory data register should be loaded with that value. So that's the data path we're going to enable. Everything else we're not going to enable. So let's look at what we should enable. What are the signals? 
So first of all, we find state 33. That's our next state. Uh, it looks like, uh, well, let's do, let's do the things that we're going to make sure that's going to happen, and then we're going to eliminate everything else that we're not going to do. What needs to happen? First of all, memory I.O. should be enabled, right? If you look at this, memory I.O. should be enabled because we're really enabling memory, accessing memory. And we're going to read from memory, not write to memory. And if you look at these control signals again, uh, read, write. Read is 0, write is 1. So we're going to do a read. Data size. How big should our read be? In LC3B, there are two data sizes, byte or word. And instruction is a word. It's 16 bits. It's not a byte, which means that data size should be set to word. We're going to read a word. If you look at this control signal, it's byte or word, which means that data size should be 1, right? Byte corresponds to 0. OK. So we've enabled memory. We've set the data size to be 0, uh, to, to be word. And MAR is also input to this address control logic. And there's some magic that happens in this address control logic that says memory should be enabled because uh, the address actually corresponds to not the I.O. devices. Right? So there's some combination logic here that determines this control signal. So this memory enabled control signal is determined by combination logic that is not described. It is described in the chapter, but is not described in hardware here with gates. But I already described to you what it does, right? And the hope is that somebody implements that logic such that that memory enable is set to 1. Now we, we have enabled access to memory, right? Look at this. The memory also has an output that says R. Well, let's get back to that. This is the conditional uh, bit. Is the memory ready? Right? That's the ready bit of the memory. But let's say memory gives us some output. We need to select that output and not the output coming from the memory I.O. devices. What is the control signal for that? Well, again, the address control logic selects that appropriately. So this is not part of the control store. So this state is interesting because there are control signals that are generated in this state that do not necessarily come from the control store. Right? So this is where you have hardwired control. That's not part of your control store. There are some data path elements that, are, that go through the hardwired control. And I'll let you, I'll, I'd like you to think about why this is hardwired. Could it be done with a control store? Think about it. We'll get back to this. It's very tough to do this with a control store, actually. OK. So the hardwired logic selects the output of this MUX. And we've already enabled MIO, so we're going to select the output of this MUX as, uh, as coming from this, because the other output actually loads the MAR with what's in the uh, MDR with what's coming from the bus. That's not what we want to do, right? We want to load the MDR with the value coming out of memory. So this is already set. We already set MION. And we're going to load MDR, which means that LDMDR should be set to 1. Now we find LDMDR in this, and it happens to be here. And that's all we need to do in the data path. The rest of the data path, all of this logic is idle in this state, right? Which means that we shouldn't do any harm. <laughs> we shouldn't load the registers. We shouldn't load the PC. Well, again, so in some cases, you can actually load the instruction register again, right? But we've already covered that. You don't want to load it because that's waste energy. So what we're going to do is we're going to set all the other signals that load the registers that change the state to zeros. Right. Do we, and, and then these are the other control signals. Gate PC, gate MDR, gate ALU, gate MAR MOX, gate shift. Well, do we want to gate anything onto bus in this state? Yeah, somebody said no. That's right. We don't want to gate anything onto the bus. But do we care? Again, we don't care, right? We can actually set all of these signals as don't cares. We could actually gate multiple things on the bus, as long as that doesn't affect your electrical correctness. It should be OK. Yes? Wouldn't that be an 
Where did that be what? Wouldn't putting multiple things on the gate cause some kind of problem? Depends on, depends on how it is designed, right? You can get you'll get a garbage value, but you don't care about the result. You're not going to latch it anywhere. Right? So but gating something onto the bus again wastes energy, right? So let's not gate anything. I mean, technically, all of these can be don't cares, but I'm going to set them to zero such that we're not going to use the bus because the state doesn't really need the bus. And if you look at this, other muxes, again, the outputs of all of these muxes are really don't cares. For example, PC mux output. It doesn't matter what input you select to pass to the output because we're not loading the PC in the state. Right? So it's, again, a don't care. But you could set it to. 0, 0, or, or anything, actually, 1, 1. Uh, destination register mux. We're not loading the register, so we don't care what ID we select, right? Again, that's a don't care. Source register 1 mux. We're not sourcing any register. We don't care. Address 1 mux. So you got the idea, right? The results of those muxes are not gated onto the bus and are not being loaded, so we don't care what those muxes select. So those are x's also. Again, you've got to be careful. Uh, if you become careless, you may be actually setting a bit that changes the state, and that will destroy your machine, right? And there have been bugs like that also. Like hu human, error, human error, if you look at dependable systems, human error is one of the bigger, biggest causes of uh, unreliability in systems. OK, uh, MAR mux. But I know that these actually don't really matter. Left shift one, again, left shift one, let's just verify that. You don't really care because you're not going to use the value anywhere. That's also an X. Now let's look at the interesting part. What are, the, what are these nine bits here, uh, which basically determine what is your next state? Well, remember, let's go to the state machine. State machine says next state is 35 if the memory tells memory gives the ready bit, if the ready bit is set. Otherwise, it's 33. We keep waiting on memory. Which means that, let's go back to the microsequencer. If the ready bit is set, the address of the next state should be 35. If the ready bit is not set, the address of the next state should be 33. Is that correct? Yes. If the ready bit is not set, the address of the next state is 33. Well, someone conveniently designed this microsequencer such that these, uh, well, these, uh, someone conveniently encoded these states such that the difference between the states is only two. And that someone also conveniently set this, I don't know how that happened, but. I guess my computer has a mind of its own. Uh, someone also conveniently set, uh, ensured that this ready bit controls bit one here, which changes the value of the address of the next state by two. Make sense? So that's now you can get an insight on how you can design this microsequencer, right? Okay, so. Which means, uh, OK, let's go back to setting these bits. First of all, IRD is 0 because we're not in the decode state. Condition. Now our condition is this ready bit. If this ready bit is set, uh, well, this ready bit should pass, basically, because it determines whether this value is 33 or 35, which means that condition 1 and 0 should be set to 0 and 1, such that only this adder uh, is enabled. Enabled meaning it, its values depend on the R bit. OK? And what are the J bits now? Well, if R bit is 0, this is 0, and your next state should be 33. How will it become 33? Only if you set the J bits to be 33. Right. And what is 33? Well, it turns out these R bits are the same as what we did before. Because the next state is the same state, right? Okay. 
Is that clear? Now you've done a more complicated state, which is fun, right? <laughs> it's all like this. It's not, nothing, nothing is magic here. You're basically programming or microprogramming the machine. You're writing the control signals that control the data path. I don't know if we really need to write the control signals for state 35. Would you guys like to? Yes, no? Yes. Sure. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you guys like microprogramming with me, I guess. <laughs> You'll do it on your own, too. <laughs> OK, let's look at state 35. State 35 specifies MDR should go to instruction register. At some point, we'll reach state 35 because memory will respond. Uh, how, how should MDR, the, the values in MDR, go into the instruction register? We're going to open the data path again. And if you look at the data path, I'm going to do this here. Oh, actually, maybe we can do this. Yeah, but you cannot see that very well there. OK. If you look at the data path, uh, MDR is here. right? And what we're trying to accomplish in this state is take MDR, get it onto the bus, and place it into the instruction register, which happens to be here. So we're going to use only this part of the data path. What a waste, right? While we're doing this, all this, the rest of the machine is useless. So think ahead. What, are we, what can we do with the rest of the machine? OK. But anyway, that's what the state machine specifies. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and this is state 35. So we first find the control store entry for state 35 and start doing what we want to do. Well, MDR, the value goes through this logic. This logic takes as input MIR0. Well, we cannot do much about that. Right? Uh, MAR0 actually, which means that we shouldn't change MAR0, by, by the way. We shouldn't load anything into MAR, right? Because that specifies the address we're loading. That's the program counter that we've loaded into there. But, uh, and the data size. So this logic is actually the alignment logic. And you will see this uh, when you implement it. This is really alignment. And I'll give you what this logic does, actually. Uh, it basically checks if MAR0 is 1 or 0. 1 means it's on, uh, it, and this only happens in bytes, right? 1 means basically the bottom bit of your address is 1. 0 means it's 0. Uh, and if you're, you can load a byte that's upper part of a word. So this is your byte 0 and byte 1 in a word. And this is what the value in your MDR. So when you load something from memory, you get the entire word. But when you're doing a load byte, what load byte specifies is you take either the 0th byte or the first byte and place it into a destination register. And if MAR0, based on MAR0, what you have really here is a mux. You pick byte 1 or byte 0. Make sense? That's the idea. But, of course, you also need to look at your data size, right? If you're doing, and this data size can be byte or word. If your data size is a word, what should happen is the entire word should go into the destination register. And there's, uh, this should go into the data path. But So I guess uh, what happens is you have this. Let me do this. You have a mux in front of this destination register uh, that selects either the entire word, the 16 bits. And if your data size is a word, you select the entire word and place it into the destination register. The more interesting case is what happens when your data size is a byte. 
then what you should load into the destination register should be either this byte or this byte. Right. Now you need to pick one of them, which means that this is an 8-bit mux that picks the bottom byte or the top byte, and it's controlled by MAR0. If MAR0 is 0, you'll pick this one. If MAR0 is 1, you'll pick this one. And then I don't remember what happens to that, because do you sign extend it or do you actually 0 extend it, right? Well, how do you figure that out? The good thing is you don't have to memorize anything. Load bytes. Oh, looks nice. You look at load bytes. It says sign extend, right? Clearly. Oh, do you guys see it? OK, it's a sign extend, the mem memory uh, value coming from memory computed with this address. Well, simple. We basically sign extend this value. And I'll just say sign extend here. You guys all know how to do a sign extension, hopefully. OK? And you get a 16-bit value that gets loaded into the destination register. So that's what's in this magic logic box. We just implement it an alignment logic for byte alignment. Well, in this case, we don't care because our data size is a word, right? So in this state, we're going to set the data size to be a word. And we already did that, I think. Oh, we didn't. We didn't set anything in this state, huh? Well, we're going to set data size to be a word. <laughs> OK, if you look at this, these control signals, data size could be a byte or word. Uh, we're going to load an instruction into the instruction register, and there are no instructions that are a single byte, which means that data size should be 1. Where's our data size signal? It's over here. OK? So our data size is 1. What else do we need to do in this state? Remember, we're loading. Uh, memory data register all the way into instruction register. We should gate memory data register onto the bus because that's the only connection we have going into the instruction register. So gate MDR should be set to 1. And you'd better set the correct bit. Or I'd better set the correct bit. Otherwise, this won't work. Which means that we shouldn't gate anything else onto the bus. right? And how do we do that? We ensure that all of the gate signals are 0. All of the other gate signals are 0. 0, 0, 0, 0. And I'm not sure if I made gate PC 0, but now I did. OK. Now we've gated the value in the MDR onto the bus. Now this value needs to go into the instruction register. We just need to load the instruction register, right? That LDIR signal should be 1. LDIR should be 1. And none of those other LD signals that load the register should be 1. Make sense? So that's, that's your, well, we haven't finished the entire microcode, but I'll, I'll just complete it for you. Again, we don't care about PC mux because we're not loading the PC or gating the PC anywhere. We don't care about any of these signals. And I hope I'm right. <laughs> we do care about memory I.O. enable. We're not enabling memory or I.O. here. And because of that, we don't care about the read-write signal. And we don't care about the left shift 1 signal because left shift 1 is, again, based on the address computation. OK. So these are the control signals that control the data path in this state 35. Now what about the control signals that determine the next state, or that partially determine the next state? Let's take a look at them. Again, this is going to be simple, right? It's an unconditional state transition. From state 35, you always go to state 32. And how do we do that? Well. Hopefully you remember what the microsequencer is, even though I don't show it to you, but I'll show it to you anyway. There's nothing you need to memorize for this. You look at the microsequencer. State 32. Unconditionally, we're going to select the address of the next state should be 32, which means that the J bits should be 32. Condition bits should not, uh, should ensure that the outputs of these adders are 0. And IRD should select the J bits. That's it. How do we do that? We said IRD is 
uh, to zero such that it selects the j bits. We ensure condition bits are zero, zero. It's an unconditional uh, trans transfer to state 32. And state 32 two is encoded this way. That's your micro instruction for this state. Again, simple, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of fun. I'm giving you three states now. 10% of the states are done. <laughs> what about the next, uh, yeah, next state? Let's do the next state also. Go ahead. State 19 is the same as state 18. Yes, that's right. Four states, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> More than 10%. <laughs> Absolutely, you just copy it from there. Let's, let's take a look at one, one last state, just for fun, because this is it's actually a different state. It's, it's the most unique state, actually, in the state machine, if I can find it. That's our state. There you go. Oh. It's a decode state, state 32. Well, state 32 is here. So we know that, uh, well, what's happening in the data path? The data path, we are setting BEN to this value. Now, now that we have something in the instruction register, we can determine the, whether the branch should be taken, if the instruction is a branch, early, right? That's what uh, someone decided to do. In this state, we're going to compute the branch condition. And we're going to compute it early. We don't even know if the instruction is a branch yet. Here, the instructions are going to get decoded. And we'll see how that decoding is done. Uh, but in the data path in state 32, what's happening is you're computing that branch condition. How is that done? Let's see. Where is our data path? There you go. Well. You have something in the instruction register. You check some of the bits in the instruction register. So there's some logic here. And that magic logic is not shown in this data path, but it is shown here. It's part of that control. And BEN is a register. Unfortunately, there should be a load BEN signal, maybe. There you go. And in this state, load BEN should be enabled, should be set to 1. Because this is where this computation is done. And that's the only thing that's happening in the data path, right? So load BEN is set to 1. And if you look at the state machine again, there's nothing else really happening in the data path in the state. Uh, let me take this again. Which means that, again, we're wasting a lot of hardware doing nothing in that particular clock cycle. But we're going to remedy that in the next lecture. Uh, but this also means that all of the other load signals should be zeros. We're not loading any other register. And we're not gating anything onto the bus, right? If you look at this, this is all local. So there is a load BEN register that's hidden here. And you're just setting the. Uh, B, uh, there's a BN register sitting here. You're just setting the control signal for that. And inputs are coming from the instruction register directly. They're not, there's no way you can load the instruction register onto the bus. OK, so gate, all of the gating signals are also zeros. We're not gating anything onto the bus. And again, we don't really care about the muxing signals. And again, you've got to be careful. And we're not loading. Uh, we're not enabling memory, which means that we don't really care about the data size. OK? So that's it on the Yeah. Did I miss something? I think you put a 1 on the Yeah. Where did I put a 1? Just to the right This one? Oh, did I do load IR? Yeah. Oh, that's terrible, right? That's really terrible. What would I be loading the IR with if that's, that was the case? Some random value that's on the bus, right? Good, good catch. I would have now. Now think about how you debug this machine once you make a mistake like this. Right? It's <laughs> terrible. I guess you got to verify all of this very well. Yeah, but well, thank you.
So this is a 0, this is a 1. In fact, to be even more, uh, this is a 1, <laughs> and this is a 0. OK, uh, now let's look at the more interesting part, what's happening on the control side. If you look at the state machine, we're in state 32. What is our next state? Well, our next state could be any of the 16 states. And how are, they, how are they determined by? They're determined by the opcode, right? For example, the add state is 1. And conveniently, someone designed this state assignment such that the states that correspond to different opcodes have the state numbering such that the opcode specifies the number of the state. state uh, or, or, so if you look at this, add goes to state 1. What's add's opcode? Oh, 0, 0, 0, 1. And goes to state 5. What's and's opcode? 0, 1, 0, 1, which is 5. I'll give you one more, I guess. Uh, XOR goes to state 9. What's XOR's opcode? Hopefully 9. Yes, it is 9. <laughs> Good. You'd better verify all of them, by the way, doing <laughs> before doing what we're going to do. But uh, what we're going to do is, well, I guess someone designed the microsequencer also such that you could select the next state address based on purely the opcode, concatenated with some other some bits. And this is where I lost my microsequencer. And it's here. So your next state is really dependent on what your opcode is, which means that this IRD should select this input of the MUX, and that's it. And if we look at the IRD bit, it's 1. We don't care about condition bits, right? Because we're not selecting the output of this MUX. Uh, we're not selecting this output. And we don't really care about the J bits also. Right. So this is the only state where uh, you have a lot of don't cares in these nine bits that specify how your control structure should operate, should determine your next state address. OK? It's a lot of fun, right? <laughs> now your job <laughs> is to actually do this for the remaining, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, 26 states. Should be fun. Uh, by the way, we'll have a recitation session on Friday. There won't be any lecture. The TAs will cover your questions. Uh, is that right? Uh, and uh, come up with questions. So you can actually come up with questions related to LC3B operation, microprogram control operation. I didn't cover everything I wanted to cover so far, but that's OK. As long as you learned how a microprogram machine operates, I'm happy. OK? I guess I'll see you Monday. And make sure you do the lab well. <laughs>